things. It is so thick and impenetrable in places that the procuring of game is difficult. You not only have to be an excellent tracker, but you have to be very, very aware. You've got a lot of difficult terrain to negotiate when you're dealing with these animals. Though the pine barrens have edible medicinal plants available, in the wintertime especially, these are few and far between. Its climate is also one where it's got a high humidity, and you compound that with winds and cold weather, and you're dealing with a cold that tends to penetrate, a killing cold. And in the summer, you have the opposite. There's areas of the pine barrens that have no wood. Um, the, the sun reflecting off the sands just will burn holes in your head. Here we got a fox, left front track of a fox, and he's slowing down from a run. You can tell by the, how deep he is in the heel. You can see the oval shape in here of the track. Tracking is a window to the past. You can tell more from an animal's tracks than you can tell seeing that animal with the naked eye because in the ground is left a portion of that animal's history, a chapter of its life. You can tell how much an animal weighs exactly, whether it's right or left oriented, whether it's male or female, whether it had any injuries, exactly what it was doing and where it was going, whether it had eaten and, and or, or is going hunting. This whole thing has got rolls all over the place. We got our first uh, hair, but it's a rabbit hair. That's good enough. But it could be weasel or mouse. Okay, there it is. Look at this plant here. All straight, all butchered by deer feet. It's an unnatural abrasion. When a trail comes out like this and goes into a lot of little runs all the way down and through, it's called a manifold. It's like a blood vessel. It splits on the main vein and goes out into the capillaries. Look underneath these bushes, you're going to see a lot of trails. If you people believe everything I say, you're fools. Your job is not to believe me. Your job is to prove me right or prove me wrong. And I bet you can't prove me wrong. survival are only half of what survival is all about. You're looking to strike a balance. You're looking to fit in, to become part of this whole thing. No, one with the whole thing. So that your presence in any landscape is not a detriment, does not destroy, but enhances the landscape. When you go into a survival situation, and my hopes are that after this class, for once in your life, you say to yourself, I'm taking a weekend, I'm taking a week, and give yourself the biggest gift you can give yourself in life. Go to the woods, drop all of your clothes except for a set of shorts, and walk in and say, Mama, take me. You will establish such a connection to the earth like you have never felt before. You'll realize in a real way that everything you, you sleep in, everything you eat, all your medications, all your clothes comes from the earth. Nothing that else you can do in nature will show you that. I think what Tom yeah, yeah, brings out is there's yeah, a yeah. tremendous appetite for life and joy in, in, in living. And particularly, you know, living... Living in a caretaker kind of way is, is you know, like take care of our families and take care of our loved ones and everything. I just had to find something that could teach me how to live outdoors because 
there were no uh, ways for me to take uh, in conventional society. I think conventional society is already pretty overburdened. We have a lot of homeless people on the streets that can't take care of all these people. And I, I thought maybe I could help by helping take care of myself in, in a natural setting what's already existed for a long time and what hopefully will exist forever. because all you do is use the debris that you can find on the ground, uh, dead trees or whatever. We don't take anything live. And uh, it's just a ridge pole and then some uh, cross joints. There's only one shelter that known to man that will keep a person warm no matter how cold it gets or cool no matter how hot it gets without the use of any, any internal heating device, such as a fire or any bed clothes, such as sleeping bags or blankets. In a survival situation, you just don't have these things a lot of times. So a debris hut um, is like a huge insul insulated shelter that will insulate the student or the survivalist from the elements, keep them warm, even if they have nothing, no matter how cold it gets, no matter how hot it gets. Um, it'll never get hotter than body heat on the desert and it will never get colder than body heat in the winter. So it's essential. It's critical. It's the most paramount skill that a student can have. Without a shelter, in many cases, you're dead. When I was a child, um, seven years old, I lived on the outer northeastern edge of Pine Barrens. My backyard literally extended from the back door to Camden across the wilderness called the Pine Barrens. Where I grew up, there was nobody really to play with. You were in the woods. So people did one of two things, kids. They either went to town or they went in the woods, and I went in the woods. Well, I met this other boy in the woods, Rick, and we became pretty good friends. And it wasn't long after that that he introduced me to his grandfather, Stalking Wolf. And his grandfather was full-blood Apache tracker. And for 10 years, I lived here with him. The skills of awareness that I learned um, in the woods are, are skills that I can apply in a city, in my practice, in my patients, and picking up information and picking up subtleties um, in a person, in a person's body, in their behavior, in their talk. What I've learned here and what I will continue to learn here are uh, some of the old methods and I will be more secure with myself, more at peace with nature um, and certainly feel more comfortable and feel more connected to the earth, which is really where we all are even though we don't realize it sometimes. People kind of learn a new respect for the things that are provided for them and with that respect um, kind of comes a protection of the earth. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can get across is um, not only a self-confidence in learning how to use the things out in the woods, um, know how to build your fire, your shelter, and be more self-sufficient, and thus um, being more independent and relying on yourself. When I was using drugs, like I was in my own world, withdrawn from everybody, and I didn't, uh, I never talked anything out, you know. The drugs themselves were a mask. Uh, now that I don't use drugs anymore, I had to learn uh, to reach out to people and 
to reach out to people means I have to uh, ask for help when I feel down, depressed. And here I'm able to uh, do that because there's people that understand with similar backgrounds here. Okay. So if he's good, I'm good, let I'm him good too, man. Oh, okay, we'll do it. You do it. Yeah. That's looking good. All right. I was looking kind of uh, school and teachings that are not connected to a kind of military survival, but are connected with nature, like really having a, a, a setup which. Um, gives you an effective tool of living with nature. containers in the woods is, or in a survival situation is, is extremely difficult if you go with the old methods of pottery and basket making that was, you know, baskets that will hold water, the Apaches had water baskets. The easiest method by far is taking a slab of wood and burning into it a depression. The slab of wood will hold water, it will hold hot liquids. Um, it, it's easy to make fire makes it. You do no carving except to scrape it out when it's done with a rock, you know, scrape all the char off it. And it makes a very fast container for cooking, for eating, for whatever. <laughs> of the land and how the land operates will give you a, a better sense of oneness with the earth and that can bring you a great deal of personal satisfaction. This type of situation, which is more based on the American Indian or Native American uh, philosophies and things with the Aboriginal philosophies and methods in Australia, quite frankly, they're very similar both ways, the philosophy and the methods are very, very similar. I've always wanted to, I've always had that, that inkling and these kind of feelings for doing this, yet I never had the guts, I guess, to do it now, or nor have the teacher. See, I've always thought I would find a teacher sometime to help me break through and do it and just go live on nothing, with nothing. And then I ran into Tom and just was like, boom, that's, that's it. That's the name of that thing. Grandfather's philosophy of survival was simple. You don't fight nature. You don't fight the elements. You know, when I see backpackers go into the woods, I, I get this impression of people landing on the moon watching them bring all their earthly possessions in and without them they could never survive. We lose them by the dozens every year. Survival teaches you to know yourself intimately as well as the earth. 
and you can bring that back to society because the same things work there as they do in this reality what tom does in some of his lectures would be very it's a very good acting job and i don't mean acting in artifice but i mean acting in the sense of when he's telling stories a lot of times he's reliving being in the story which is the primary goal of an actor that's all nothing more till christ comes about mary or the case as long as i'm here now get out of here george actor is continually trying to live out another person's role not his but a role that has been written with different circumstances different background different history and you have to take yourself out of yourself and explore that other other reality it's, it's totally applicable in a way out of the 23 primitive methods of building a fire the bow drill is the most effective because the bow drill um, can concentrate a lot of body energy to produce that coal where other methods do not concentrate that much energy they're a little more difficult to make they don't work well but out of the 23 methods the bow drill is the most effective no matter what the weather after the bow drill is burned in you have to lubricate the handhold because if you don't the handhold is going to burn through. The handhold is going to get hot. So you lubricate it with whatever you can find. Body grease from the sides of the nose, from the chin, even from behind the ears, so to speak. Even the hair will lubricate it enough. Pitch from a pine tree, various slime molds that will also lubricate a handrail. Your first fire is like, oh, God, this is it. And you get that first fire. From that point on, you'll never have trouble with fire again. We're going to be giving you pieces of wood that are blocks of wood. You're going to have axes in your knives. You're certainly not going to have you do it with rocks the first time out. We'll teach you the use of rocks. But don't get the idea that, wow, I need a piece of wood like this and this tall to make a bow drill. You'd be forever. devices and you're going to have to make them now you got 50 people doing it six groups so i would suggest you organize find out who's going to make some really volatile tinder remember when you make cedar tinder it's got to be mixed with something who's going to make the bow the drill the fireboard the handhold who's going to get the grease and who's going to make the cordage no axes, no saws, no tools. And you've got one hour. If there's no fire in an hour, there's no fire until Sunday. There's no your shelter back until Sunday. There's none of your clothes until Sunday. You will sleep exactly like you are until you get a fire. Alright, we need cedar. Who wants? I'll go collect cedar with someone from the swamp. I'll go with Does somebody help me get the stuff and I'll do cordage. Alright. Who's getting that stone hat? Do the stone hat. I did just a couple of years ago. Let's get the stone hat. You guys got the fireboard in the. We're going to make a fireboard. Yeah, 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 we're going to make a fireboard. Y
me to hand hold back here. Yeah. Might as well. Hand hold in the in the drill and the and the board. Let's go. All you have to do is to blow that tinder bundle to flames. And one of us has to be watching. One of us has to be watching. Hey, and I want you to all do it along this road so we can keep an eye on you. We can get like a branch. Where's Jeffrey? Should we have to use this as a, as a firewood? There's enough wood there to run the boat drill. Okay. Sounds good to me.
what we don't realize we're doing is we far exceeded the carrying capacity of the land. We don't live in harmony and balance with the earth. What have I done for my grandchildren? What have I done for my children? Have I saved them a portion of the earth so they can enjoy it as I have? Something miraculous happened. My baby was born. Three months after he was born, I went, um, I picked up my little boy and my sacred pipe and we drove off down to the Pine Barrens, just me and him. I remember him all bundled up. And I brought him back down this long pathway to our sacred area. And this area is special. It is one of the most gorgeous areas of the Pine Barrens. The stream was so crystal clear, you could swim in it and drink at the same time. The pines were just gorgeous. The cedars were like a cathedral forest. And it was where grandfather and I spent a lot of our time. We had, uh, that's where I took my first sweat lodge. I attended my first pipe ceremony and so much else. And as I turned the corner to get into the area, it was garbage as far as your eyes could see. The only place I had to lay down my baby was on a pile of garbage. And I realized right then that my own child would never know the Pine Barrens I knew. In fact, he would never know any wilderness I knew, even 15, 20 years ago. I realized then that we are a society of people that kill our grandchildren to feed our children. And I know that somewhere in grandfather's mind, he knew what was going to happen that day. Because I made a commitment then that I wasn't going to run back to the woods. I was going to start a school to try to re-educate people. You can do all the sign carrying in the world and all the petition signing. It's not going to save the wilderness. Only through re-education can we save the wilderness. <laughs>